Good afternoon. Welcome to the Heritage Foundation and our Lewis Lehrman Auditorium. We, of course, welcome those who join us on all of these occasions on our heritage.org website. I would ask everyone in-house to check that cell phones have been turned off as a courtesy as we prepare to begin. And, of course, our Internet viewers are always welcome to send questions or comments simply emailing speaker at heritage.org. And we will post the program on the Heritage homepage for everyone's future reference as well. Hosting our discussion today is James Gattuso, who is Senior Research Fellow in Regulatory Policy, part of our Institute for Economic Freedom and Opportunity. He handles telecommunications and regulatory issues. Prior to joining us here at Heritage, he was Vice President for Policy at the Competitive Enterprise Institute. Additionally, he served as Vice President for Policy Development with Citizens for a Sound Economy as De Deputy Chief of the Office of Plans and Policy at the Federal Communications Commission and as an Associate Director of the President's Council on Competitiveness in the White House. He is also bipartisan. He received his undergraduate degree at the University of Southern California and his JD from UCLA. Please join me in welcoming Jim Catuso. Jim. Thank you, John. Uh, we're here to talk about television today, and as you may have known, television is not what it used to be. Um, we, a lot of us grew up in an era where there was basically three television sources, ABC, NBC, and CBS. It was good for the FCC. There wasn't much for them to watch over. Maybe not so good for the rest of us. Um, now, the, I don't know if you noticed it, but the, 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 there was a significant landmark uh, that, that, that was reached in the television industry just the end of last month. And, and maybe it, it can be, uh, um, in future historians will, will note that, that was the final death of the old system of broadcast television. And that was the decision by the CW network to drop cartoons from its Saturday morning lineup. Generations of Americans grew up watching television, watching cartoons on Saturday morning not watching their families, not playing outside, <laughs> not, not on computers because we didn't have them. Uh, that, that, that is now gone. And, and, and actually, it, it's not irrelevant to what's happening in the broader broadcast world. Um, we no longer watch the same things. We no longer are required to or forced to, to be uh, um, limited to just a few choices. The, the number and type of sources of television are almost endless. Now, at my own house, at home, we're probably a, a microcosm of what's happening out there in the broader world. We have four televisions at my house. One in the living room is our legacy television that has cable and a VCR. In the, in the kitchen, we have our DVR and that's our only high-definition set. In the bedroom, we, we expand, and we have our, our Blu-ray, which allows us to get Netflix. And stuck in the basement is a television that only gets Apple TV. <laughs> so the decision of what to watch is a hard one. Not only do we have to decide what show and what source, but we have to consult a chart to see what television it will be shown on. But one thing that hasn't changed over this tremendous transition is FCC regulation of the medium. We still have many rules in place that have been in place for a generation or more, regulating TV as if it were still ABC, NBC, and CBS. Will that change? We don't know. Should it change? I think the answer is yes. Um, so that's what brings us here today. We have three speakers who will sort of walk us through the regulations that are in place, what should be done with them, what should be thrown out, and what should be kept. Um, and hopefully we'll have an interesting discussion and maybe a little bit of fun with it too. Um, our first speaker to start us off today is Fred Campbell. He's executive director of the Center for Boundless Innovation, which is perhaps one of the best named groups I, I can remember in Washington. Uh, there's a lot of colorful names out there that, 
That's one of the most colorful. Um, he has at least two qualifications that, that are of interest to us today. One, he was chief of the Wireless Bureau at the FCC under Chairman Kevin Martin. And secondly, he served in the 101st Airborne as an Arabic linguist, which I think qualifies him to participate in the hand-to-hand -hand fighting that is broadcast regulation. <laughs> if you join me in welcoming Fred Campbell. Well, thanks, James, for the introduction, and thanks to Heritage Foundation for having the event. It's a, one of the best uh, meeting rooms in the city, in my view, for this for this kind of conversation. So it's it's a great uh, location. Uh, I'm going to try to give a very brief overview of sort of how we got to where we are today. The first type of broadcasting uh, was radio broadcasting. Think AM radio. And at the time uh, it first began to enter the market in the early 20th century, there was really uh, a lot of experimentation on how the business side of it was going to work. Folks tried to raise money through uh, subscriptions, through uh, local tax revenue, uh, by charging a fee on the uh, radios themselves, or at least these were all ideas. I'm not sure all were implemented. Uh, it turned out that advertising became the primary way to finance the radio industry. Uh, by the time television came along, uh, maybe the first broadcast was in 1929, but it really didn't catch on until post-World War II, I think, is when it became a more mass uh, market uh, service. Um, advertising was pretty well established in, in the radio broadcasting industry, uh, and television tended to follow suit. Uh, I raise this, though, because... Uh, in 1952, Zenith, which was a big name in TV at the time, uh, filed a petition at the FCC to be permitted to provide subscription television service. And the FCC did not decide the petition until 1969, I believe. About, they sat on it basically for 16 years. And then when they decided, well, yes, we'll authorize this, they said there can be no more than one subscription TV channel per market. Uh, and a host of other restrictions, which means it didn't really take off as a service. Uh, at the same time, uh, in the uh, 40s and then more predominantly, uh, again, a mass market service in the 60s and 70s, uh, cable came along as a way of delivering video to the home. And there it was uh, largely unregulated until the late 60s, in part because the FCC wasn't sure it had authority. Uh, and that became a subscription model. Um, and incidentally, uh, telephone companies at the time were prohibited through a DOJ consent decree from entering that market. So the FCC sort of divided, divided up the world. You had telephone, which couldn't provide video, and you had cable operators, which incidentally, I believe, were prohibited from offering telephone. And you had uh, over-the-air television broadcast, which had to uh, provide their service for free, um, with this little exception for one channel, which really wasn't going to promote a lot of market activity. Um, that went along uh, along those lines for uh, quite a while. There were a court case, however, a cable operator decided they, you know, or traditionally, they a cable operator could send TV signals over their wire without paying the local TV station or the copyright holders. Uh, Congress decided, and that in part was due to Supreme Court decision. Uh, Congress changed the Copyright Act in 1976 to. Um, provide compensation to the copyright holders through the copyright office, it's a, a mandatory copyright license. And, uh, but it, the fees were relatively small set by the copyright office and the like. So when your cable operator shows a over the air broadcast TV signal, the copyright holders are getting compensated in that way. When cable was revamped in 1992, because it was determined at that time that it wasn't competitive, and that's sort of the pre-satellite TV era and pre-internet era for the most part. Uh, Congress added a provision that said local TV stations, in addition to this copyright uh, provision, can also negotiate fees for the use or retransmission, they call it, of their programming by the cable operator. So when you and for satellite TV, a technical term is MVPD. So when you turn on your 
cable or satellite TV and you watch a uh, broadcast network channel, ABC, CBS, and the like, there's often, I would say probably in most all cases with those, with those national networks, a, a fee that's being exchanged between the cable or satellite TV provider and the TV station with that signal. Uh, enter into the mix today the uh, advent of online video distribution and competition potentially between online video distributors and the and then two kind of primary existing modes of video competition. <clears throat> In addition, now what were traditionally telephone companies also were allowed to enter the market with some legislative change in the 90s. Uh, you now have a lot of competition in the video marketplace. And the question becomes, uh, do the laws governing the space, which are restrictive in a number of ways, cable operators also have a, a number of restrictions based on the fact that they were once the only wired provider of cable television. Uh, do they still make sense in a market where you can consume video uh, over the air on, I guess, a traditional uh, cable system or on the internet, not to mention the you know, a plethora of, you know, whether it be DVD, Blu-ray, or even, I, you still have a VHS. That's great. I haven't seen one of those in a while. But I guess if you have a lot of tapes that you recorded of family and the like, it's pretty useful. I saw a photograph back there somewhere, too. <laughs> that's an audio file thing. So that, that, that's the general background of why there's tension here. You have government regulations requiring certain parts of the industry to do certain things based on a, a long historical development. And we should maybe reevaluate that regime based on uh, market developments. Our next speaker is Gus Hurwitz, who is a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute and an assistant professor at the University of Nebraska. Uh, and uh, also in his background, th th there are some interesting uh, facts. He um, once worked at Los Alamos uh, National Laboratories in New Mexico and is in the Guinness Book of World Le Record for, for having the internet land speed record, I inter internet, um, 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 I think I'm missing a word there, but. The, the, the internet, internet two, Internet actually. two land speed. <laughs> um, inter right, I, I don't well, which is a research uh, version of the internet. Okay, I didn't know what it was, but it sounds very important and worth talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Gus Hurwitz. Uh, now, I, I need to start, I guess, um, by saying two things. First, the record was subsequently superseded by other people who were involved in the research, so I'm no longer in the Guinness Book of World Records, but at one point I was. Um, <laughs> Give me the new name, we'll, we'll, next event we'll have them here. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, and thing number, point number two, uh, as with Fred, the hand-to-hand -hand combat uh, skills could be really useful. Los Alamos, nuclear weapons. Let's blow it all up. That might be the best approach to uh, the existing regulatory uh, framework for uh, video. Um, and on that note, I'm going to uh, build on what Fred said um, to provide some uh, of the legal background, a bit more uh, detail as to the uh, way that the laws um, have evolved in the video marketplace, um, bring us up to where we are today, and then ask some questions about uh, where we might want to go based upon where we are today. So Fred gave a really great um, uh, overview kind of how the technology has evolved. Um, uh, we went from radio to television to cable to satellite, uh, and now uh, we have internet entering the mix. At each of those steps, uh, regulators, either through uh, FCC regulation or through legislation created by Congress, um, updated the laws to match what was going on with the changing technology. So the FCC, they really struggled um, in the 50s and 60s to try and figure out what they were going to do uh, to regulate cable. Why did they do this? Why were they concerned about cable? As hard as it is to believe their thinking wasn't only hey, we're the regulators. This is something for us to regulate. Let's go do something. Um, uh, the uh, concern that they had was um, uh, broadcast television, and in particular, UHF television. Um, they, we originally had uh, a small number of channels called VHF that used one uh, block with spectrum, 
folks at the FCC came up with another block of spectrum that we could use uh, called UHF that gave us another 50, 60 channels um, that we could uh, broadcast television signals on. But UHF spectrum wasn't nearly as good. There were technical problems with it um, uh, compared to VHF. Um, UHF was particularly positioned, however, to be um, advantageous or useful for local broadcasters. So the FCC was very concerned about getting local broadcasters, having local content and news information sources in every community. Um, when cable came along, there was a lot of concern that what cable was going to do was undermine their efforts uh, at promoting localism, primarily promoting localism through UHF. So the FCC started trying to regulate cable in ways that would require cable to carry all VHF and UHF signals to make sure that there was um, parity between VHF, UHF, and cable. Um, this was a story 50s, 60s, into the 70s. Um, Fred mentioned that there, was, uh, there were a couple of really important Supreme Court cases um, in the 70s. The, these Supreme Court cases said that cable companies didn't need to pay copyright owners Con uh, anything for retransmitting their signals. Congress heard that and they said, uh, no, no, there's a problem with this. We're going to put in place the compulsory license system uh, that uh, Fred suggested. Uh, the reason for doing this was uh, to allow cable to continue to grow and thrive. Hey, they can get access to the content, but do so in a way that didn't harm the existing industry. That required uh, the uh, payments to be made to the programmers. Um, a couple of years later, uh, the FCC, there were changes at the FCC and their rules went away, um, but in uh, 1984, Congress uh, passed the first of two major cable acts. Um, a couple of years later, 1992, Congress passed another cable act. Uh, these put in place a, a series of rules, must carry and retransmission consent. Uh, these are the rules that, uh, again, Fred was uh, um, alluding to that say cable companies, they have to carry um, local broadcasters if local broadcasters say, hey, we are going to say you must carry us. Now the caveat here is they get to carry the signal for free. So I'm a local broadcaster, I say to uh, Time Warner, uh, um, hey, you guys must carry my signal. Time Warner then has to carry, based upon some capacity constraint issues, they have to carry my signal, but I don't get any money for this. I can also say, however, um, if you want to carry my signal, you can, but you got to pay me. This is called retransmission consent. Um, if I say this, then Time Warner needs to uh, negotiate with me. We come up with a price um, that uh, uh, they're going to offer me, usually money nowadays, um, and that allows me to carry the signal. A couple years later, we started to have another technology coming in, satellite technology. Um, and we saw Congress come in and update all the laws again. They added um, a, another uh, set of rules, another set of modifications to the existing um, structure um, in order to, again, promote the development of this new technology, make it possible for satellite to come in and uh, enter as a competitor with cable, but also do so in a way that uh, didn't, that tried to maintain balance, parity between cable, satellite, and the broadcasters so that the entire ecosystem would continue to thrive. So what we saw historically was every couple of decades a new technology came along. And Congress, it, the new technology upset everything um, and Congress tried to come up with some legislative fixes. Um, they were always controversial. Congress probably never got anything um, uh, right enough for uh, everyone to be perfectly happy, but Congress kept trying to keep this machine rolling along. Well, now we've got the internet, and this is another 20, 10, 20 year evolution, but the internet's different because it's not a single technology that's disrupting everything. The internet is causing the video marketplace to, depending on your perspective, explode, collapse, converge. Um, it's a diaspora of different types of media. Good so, SAT word. Yeah, yes. Diaspora is good, yeah. <laughs> Those of you um, studying for the SAT. Uh, it's being censored, though, by yeah. someone oh. higher. Yes. Tornado, Tornado warning. Oh. Take shelter now. <laughs> Check local media. 
Okay. Broadcasters. So th th this is go. why the local broadcasters are historically <laughs> important. Local news and information. If you're getting... Chris, how did you pull that off? <laughs> <laughs> and, and yet we're ignoring them. If, if you were to be uh, getting your uh, local video, if you were wa to be watching streaming uh, ABC from New York over Aereo and living in Lincoln, Nebraska, you would miss the tornado warning. And this would be really, let me tell you, I live in Lincoln, Nebraska. This would be really bad. Oof. You care about the local media, um, the local news and information. Um, so the, the, the way that uh, media has changed, we now have a lot more players. It's a lot easier for new players to enter the market. We also have media coming in different forms. So historically, um, broadcasters, they would transmit a 24-hour linear stream, a con constant stream of TV that you, as a viewer, you would tune into. So you would, uh, if you missed the first three minutes of your show, you'd miss the first three minutes of your show. Today, we don't only have 30-minute shows and 60-minute shows. We don't only have uh, linear programming. We have on-demand programming. We've got YouTube. We've got Facebook videos. We've got Netflix. Netflix producing its own programming, releasing entire seasons at once. The video marketplace is uh, starting to look very different, um, which leads to two uh, general issues. First, what's the status of existing the existing regulations? Do we need them? Which parts of them do we still need? It's amazing. If you go back and look at the Communications Act, um, the definition of, a, of video programming is defined with reference to uh, channel uh, programming comparable to local broadcasters. Well, is anything that is getting distributed over the internet comparable to what local broadcasters generally broadcast? Ad-supported, linear, 30-minute pre-programmed, pre-scheduled programming. No, but the statute, it defines it in this way. The second really big question, and there, I'll give you two big questions. The uh, second big question uh, that I have, what's the role of local in the modern video ecosystem? It's not at all clear where local video, local programming fits in in the YouTube, Netflix world. I think that it's a really important form of programming that's largely being overlooked by the market today. Um, that's uh, a traditional goal of video regulation. Do we still need regulation here or not? Unclear. Uh, the last uh, big question that we face, one of the big goals of regulation historically has been to balance the power between the distributors and the programmers. Um, and this is, uh, we, we all might be familiar with the idea of uh, blackouts, the concern that, hey, uh, uh, I'm, I'm just going to pick on Time Warner today. I always pick on one company to uh, uh, fight, uh, uh, choose one company to pick on uh, from each side, uh, uh, Time Warner and CBS. Time Warner, CBS, they can't come to retransmission terms. CBS says to Time Warner, fine, we're pulling our signal. All the consumers, all the viewers who want to watch CBS, suddenly in the local market, they can't get it. Um, historically, we've been really concerned about that because these have been big Goliaths battling it out. It's been a duopoly situation. Are we as concerned about that in a vibrant marketplace? Ordinarily, in marketplaces, we expect lots of commercial negotiations to fail. We expect that uh, uh, um, I, Whole Foods, uh, General Mills, General Mills might not be able to come up come to an acceptable agreement uh, with CVS. So CVS might not carry General Mills food products for a couple of weeks, or might, they might put them in a lower, a less desirable spot on the shelves. These are negotiation failures, very, very common um, in most markets. Well, are we okay living in a world where there will be blackouts in media markets? If not, well, we might need to have some form of regulation, but that regulation is going to distort the market substantially. It's not clear that we need that uh, protecting consumers in a vibrant marketplace. Uh, so with that, uh, I hopefully have framed up at least a couple of interesting issues. Thank you. Our third speaker um, is Robert McDowell, former commissioner at the Federal Communications Commission. He was appointed to the commission in 2006 and served for seven years, I, I believe, uh, and, and really was uh, um, a beacon for, for, for people who are skeptical of regulation and supportive of liberty, both economic and, and personal. Um, 
You know, I, I, I first met uh, Commissioner McDowell when he uh, moved into his new office and at uh, the FCC, and I was struck immediately by a picture on the wall of Francisco Franco. And I thought, this is someone who's going to be a little bit different. <laughs> 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 now, now, I should, has, I, I could hasten to, to, to explain that, that, that his father was a photographer with the National Geographic. Editor. So it was actually a picture of his father who happened to be talking to Francisco Franco. Mm -hmm. but, but, but I thought it was also a sign that th 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 this man doesn't care what people think, that, that, that he's going to, to lead his own way. Um, um, he um, is now a partner at Wiley Ryan. And according to his bio, he, he lives in Virginia with, uh, uh, um, on, quote, what's left of the farm where he grew up, which is probably a, an interesting story in itself, which <laughs> maybe we get to at a later time. And join me in welcoming Robert McDowell. Thank you. Thank you, James. Uh, yeah, I can explain the Franco thing uh, later. It's, uh, <laughs> the, more importantly, there are bigger pictures of Reagan and Thatcher up yeah. on the wall there. So, uh, Churchill, a few others too. But um, so uh, many thanks to Heritage for hosting this. Uh, this is a great room, and uh, we have a great audience here. So I know there are folks from different walks of life and a lot of students here uh, as well. So uh, part of what you may have heard was from the, like the Charlie Brown cartoon of wah, 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 wah. <laughs> So I want to make sure we have enough time for Q&A so you can, and, and don't be afraid. We're talking in, uh, you know, media policy wonk uh, speak uh, here for part of this. But um, I think it's safe to say that the 80 and a half, now half almost year old statute, the Communications Act of 1934, which celebrated its 80th birthday back in June, uh, is in need of a fundamental rewrite. I think we can all agree that markets and technology have changed tremendously in the past 80 years. Uh, there was no television in 1934. Uh, phones were run by manual switchboards you know, operators with headsets, uh, you know, Pennsylvania 6, 5,000, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, things have changed tremendously, yet, despite a few, and excellent uh, history here outlined by my colleagues on the panel, despite some tweaks to the Communications Act of 1934, the 34 Act is still the bedrock foundation for the 84 Act, the 92 Act, and the 96 Act, and others. Um, and so the fundamental thinking has not changed. You as a consumer, and I understand there's some university students in the room. You want to raise your hands? Okay. Whoa, okay. So, <laughs> remember your audience, gentlemen. Uh, so, okay. So, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, this is quickly becoming the first screen. I've got some statistics I can cite here in a second to, that proves that out, but just having you, this focus group is a great focus group for us to work on right now. You can nod your heads. As I watch my kids, I have a 15 year old, a 13 year old, and a 7 year old. And so, I've been watching them for years. They're my focus group. And early on, uh, this became their first screen. It's not their only screen. The, the fixed screen is very, very important. Um, but what, what that means is there's competition. And you don't really care how that information gets to you or if you're doing your own user-generated content, how it gets sent back up to wherever you're sending it, right? So, but it could travel over license spectrum, radio frequencies that are licensed or unlicensed, like Wi-Fi get backhauled by coaxial cable, traditionally used by cable companies, or fiber optics, or even sometimes copper, or microwave, or satellite. So there's before it gets between its point A and point B of origination and termination, it has traversed not only different platforms and technologies, but probably different countries as well. It's all chopped up into ones and zeros, um, and it's a slurry of information that is still kind of magic to me. I was a liberal arts major, but you know, uh, there's some wonderful engineers, the unsung heroes of all of this, um, who make this all possible. And so the laws haven't kept up with that. That 1934 act I talked about is divided into these silos, which the FCC struggles with every day. Uh, and I won't bore you with all of them, but they're based on the technology that was used in 1934 and the state of the market of 1934. Um, so it's in desperate need of a comprehensive rewrite. And that's very difficult to do. I'm not naive, uh, but we're at a think tank, so let's think, uh, you know, about uh, how that could be rewritten. But overall, this is a great time to be in a windowless room. Um, 
right? Those are sturdy doors, right? And they're sturdy doors, but you know, here's, here's what I'm banking on this, which is if a tornado, we're right by the Capitol, so if a tornado hits the Capitol, that's going to make international news, right? So what are the odds of that actually happening? <laughs> okay, we're, gonna, we're, we're gambling here. Um, but it's a great time to be a video consumer. So, you know, video consumption time, hours watched of video are up overall. Let me bore you with a few statistics. So there's over-the-top video, right? You can think Netflix or whatever, but YouTube, whatever. But um, BTIG uh, says there are now about 1.8 billion uh, monthly streaming hours for uh, Netflix alone in this country, and that rivals broadcast networks. Broadcast network content is still the most widely watched video content, but more and more of that is being watched online and over the top as well. So the point of all these statistics is there's competition and there's convergence um, as these technologies, those silos I talked about, really just kind of blend thanks to you, consumers, and wonderful engineers, and business decisions, which in some ways are working themselves around these antiquated laws, but also obviating the need for their, their modernization. Uh, Cisco estimates that data on mobile networks is going to jump eight times by the year 2018. Are there any members of the class of 2018 here? No? Okay. Anybody have a sibling who's in the class of 2018? You're thinking about it. Okay, you do. Okay. So by the time they graduate from... Davidson College. Okay. They, they, there will be eight-fold jump in data on mobile networks, and that's largely due to video. Okay, video, the explosion of video. Um, and that's, so that's more upload and download um, usage than uh, we saw in laptops last year. So, la so in other words, laptops have kind of become a little bit of a thing of the past. It's the mobile platform that's the, the thing of the present and the future. Um, Nielsen, you're, are you all familiar with Nielsen? They do the TV ratings. So they've had to adapt to figure out who's watching online. You know, before it used to be these diaries you'd fill out as, People sat around the TV, which had rabbit ears, by the way, back in the day for you young youngsters. And um, they uh, would, you'd write in a diary, The Wonderful World of Disney on Sunday nights. A few of you are old enough. James is old enough to remember that. So, and that would reflect the ratings, you know, who's watching, and they would take samples. Um, so they, Nielsen is saying that broadband only homes at the same time, and this is probably excluding mobile, uh, although I need to drill down on that. Uh, rose sharply last year. More than 2 million homes cut the cord, and that's a 400,000 uh, home household increase just over a year. Uh, and that is phenomenal. So we're seeing a lot of interesting consumer demand here. At the same time, there are 1 million new antenna-only homes. So the rabbit ears I talked about that you may or may not be familiar with, those are coming back, sort of like uh, vinyl records that you referred to earlier, I think. Um, so they're kind of coming back, but in a, in a good way, probably better than vinyl, for, you know, because that's an audiophile thing. Because people are cutting the cord, they're subscribing to video, uh, cable TV video and, and satellite video less. Charter Communications, a big cable company, 25% um, of, um, of its subscribers are not uh, subscribing to video. I think that's a very compelling statistic. So um, the one million new antenna-only homes, uh, it went from 10.9 million in the second quarter of 2013 to over 12 million of second quarter of this year. Um, so we really need a rewrite. Uh, I think that's the bottom line here. Uh, the market, by the way, will decide the value of spectrum. So in 2012, there was uh, the Spectrum Act of 2012 passed in a large, with a large bipartisan vote of Congress, a phrase you don't hear very often. Uh, but this one did. And it was to give broadcasters a voluntary incentive to relinquish all or part of their spectrum in exchange for money. And some would go to the Treasury as well. So this was something where broadcasters came to the table, wireless companies came to the table, other, other tech companies came to the table. And uh, the FCC is now struggling with how to uh, execute this. And it might take a while. Uh, and devil's in the details. It will be the most complex spectrum auction in, in world history. But there will be a market incentive here that if you don't want to be a broadcaster anymore, if you feel as if your spectrum is more valuable to be auctioned off, you have that option. If you want to auction, so the average broadcaster uses about six megahertz of spectrum. Just think of that as like megahertz is a measurement, so six inches of spectrum. They can they could keep three and auction three, still stay on the air and auction three and get a big lump of cash. Um, but that's going to resolve some of the debate over the value of broadcast spectrum. In the meantime, I want to close with this, which is to look at the federal government's use or lack of use of spectrum. 
it is the largest occupier of spectrum. I've seen uh, some estimates saying uh, the federal government occupies about 80% of some of the best spectrum, 1,500 megahertz, uh, that measurement, of some of the best spectrum. Um, and I think we need uh, legislation that will give federal users both a carrot and a stick to get off that spectrum and auction it for exclusive use licenses. That's the next big mother load of, of spectrum as we continue to use these devices more and as we see what's called the internet of everything really start to explode, especially in your young adulthood. That's gonna be what's really driving a lot of economic growth, maybe $14 trillion, according to Cisco, world economic additional growth um, by 2017, just in the next three years. Uh, due to the internet of everything, and the glue and the fuel for that is going to be spectrum. But a lot of that will also be video, video competition. So there's a lot uh, that can be done. There are silly rules that broadcasters live under, and they should be liberated from them. For instance, if they're running a conte contest that's online, they must still disclose all the material terms of that contest over the air, which makes no sense. Uh, they must publish their public notices in newspapers that are actually fixed papers. So who actually here in this room gets a paper delivered to their door in paper? One? No, don't be embarrassed. <laughs> no, I, I do too. I do too. No, no, I, I, I still like paper, but I look electronically too. So, And also both my parents were journalists, and I want my kids to know that they were once upon a time delivered to the doorstep so they can tell their grand. Anyone else? So out of a room of what, 80 people, one person? Get, okay, so, but that's still a FCC requirement that they publish public notices in newspapers. Um, and then here's a here's a little grenade I can throw, which is because uh, we're on Capitol. So broadcasters must continue to provide discounted airtime to politicians during elections. So an artificial discount, and I'm just throwing that out there just for fun because I know it'll be controversial. Rather than letting the market decide, I mean, websites don't have that requirement. Newspapers, if they're around, don't have that requirement. Uh, no one else has that requirement, but broadcasters do. Your cable-only channels don't have that requirement but broadcasters do. Uh, and I, you can, I'll let you fill in the blanks as to why that's the case. Um, but in any case, we need to rewrite the laws um, and we need to liberate broadcasters from, uh, from regulation because uh, th there's a lot of competition they're facing, which they weren't in 1934. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we have questions already that have come in over the internet. So um, why don't we start with uh, one that was just handed to me. Um, this involves a, a statement by Tom Hazlett. Uh, um, a question for, for someone who's not on the panel. But um, he, he asked that uh, Tom Hazlett has written that over the air broadcast TV is a waste of spectrum that stays alive not because of consumer demand, technical efficiency, or business necessity, but because of regulatory protectionism. Is he correct? Anyone want to take that? I'll, I'll, take, I'll give it a shot. Uh, I'm not sure, and I don't think anyone can be entirely sure because the regulations have been in place since the inception of over-the-air TV, in essence, and the market hasn't had a chance to sort these things out. So I, I think there generally is consensus on one point that Tom makes, which is that in order for there to be free over-the-air TV subject to the ownership limitations and localism requirements that go into the point that the FCC's goal with it was to ensure local programming, which today primarily is your local news. And there's still the majority of people, I believe, surveys show, watch their local news on, on or generated by over-the-air TV stations. Uh, so in order to provide a service that the government says must be provided for free over the air, must be individually owned, so there are rules that say no, no one company can own two TV stations in the same market that are both broadcasting one of the big four network affiliates. So you can't own both CBS and ABC in the same market, et cetera. So what the FCC has said is, we want local news to be generated by TV stations. We want them to provide it for free to the entire market, and it's not really we want. We're going to make them do it. And, and but we also want competition. So we don't want just local news. We want at least, you know, four 
least in major markets, four different local news productions and the like. And, and I guess what I would suggest is in order to accomplish all that, uh, Congress at the same time said, okay, you're, we're going to, you know, give you certain um, – market advantages that you wouldn't have in a purely free market in, in order to make that happen. So what are those? If you're going to provide an ad-driven service, which is how free service has been provided historically, uh, you've got to reach enough eyeballs or you have to have enough consumers watching you, consuming those ads for you to be attractive to the advertisers and to make any money. Uh, and and therefore continue to broadcast. Well, that's where sort of the, the must-carry slash, uh, you know, retransmission consent regime came from. As consumers switched, uh, you know, many consumers started uh, watching their over-the-air channels actually over a cable or satellite connection. Uh, you know, in the absence of certain protections, such as uh, that, that ad stream continuing to appear, how would the local TV station make money? Let's say 80% of their viewers are consuming uh, ABC over a cable or satellite connection. And but if the local ABC TV affiliate, the TV station that broadcasts it for free over the air, can't continue to sell their ads into that 80%, uh, they lose 80% of their eyeballs. So what do the advertisers do? And pretty soon you don't have a local TV station. Now that would probably be why Tom says this wouldn't even exist without regulation. When I say we can't know, I'm suggesting that, well, what if there was no requirement that over-the-air TV stations broadcast their uh, uh, signals for free? What if there weren't limitations on mergers and the like? So, so I, I guess when you look at this overall market, you, you first, you being the policymaker, has to ask themselves, what do I want to accomplish? <coughs> Um, you want to do competition. One model is for broadcast TV stations to compete with satellite and cable television, just using a wireless technology. It's completely possible technologically, as far as I, you know, as, as far as my research would indicate. That's not currently allowed. It's actually prohibited by law for them to do that. Um, the law says, "Thou shalt not be treated as an MVPD," which is the statutory term for cable or satellite TV. Uh, that, so that's one option. The law says no. Um, I, so, you know, another option is, hey, we want local TV. We want, you know, I think it's, the estimates vary, you know, 10 to 20 million homes out of 100 to 110 million homes get their, uh, actually watch their television using an antenna and an over-the-air signal, you know. Uh, Congress traditionally said we want to continue to subsidize, if you will, or uh, you know, make that available to low-income consumers. So do you want to do that? Well, I, again, I think the consensus is that then TV stations need certain rules to allow them to operate profitably in, in, as subject to that government mandate. Uh, long way of saying, it, perhaps, but it... it, it you know, we've never allowed TV stations, uh, at least since, you know, uh, the 40s, uh, 50s, whenever, um, to, to operate any way they wanted and therefore to experiment and see what they could or couldn't do in the absence of a, a predetermined congressional directives that you're going to provide this type of service in this particular manner. Um, Rob, and then no, no, no. Okay, well, we'll just move down, the, keep moving, cycling right. down the line. Um, uh, so to... Uh, flesh this out a bit with uh, three, I think, specific um, factors. First, um, Fred gets into this a bit, and uh, this is an echo of what I was saying before. It's not clear that without this, however you label it, protectionism or not, uh, we would have local broadcasters. And uh, the local question is uh, a very challenging question. Uh, so this protectionism could exist as a form of subsidy to promote the creation of local broadcast as a public good, debatable proposition, but we could think of it that way. Um, one way to think about this, and this is uh, the basis of what's going on now with the so-called incentive auctions, um, which we were hearing a bit about before, the idea with the incentive auctions is, hey, these things, they need spectrum. Hey, uh, televisions, they need spectrum. Uh, we think that the spectrum for these things is more valuable. So what we're going to do is set up a mechanism 
uh, whereby uh, the broadcasters, they can sell their spectrum back to the FCC, which will sell it back to the wireless guys, and the FCC will use money from the wireless guys to pay off the broadcasters. Very complicated, two-sided auction. We don't need to worry about the details. Uh, for this discussion, the underlying assumption is that lots and lots of broadcasters have spectrum that they recognize would be more valuable in the hands of the wireless guys. So they're looking at their broadcast TV station and they're saying, uh, well, we're not making much money on this or maybe we're losing money on this. It sure would be great if we could sell our spectrum uh, and get half a million dollars, a million dollars, ten million dollars, however much for whatever market you're in, um, from the wireless guys. Uh, basic assumption here, this spectrum is more important than is that actually a TV screen over there? I'm going to... No, it's a tech booth. It's a okay, the, a TV. Then that, that spectrum, assuming that that TV um, uh, can get over the air broadcast. Um, third point, uh, and this is, these are numbers that have changed in really interesting ways over the last couple of years. Um, a few years ago, uh, back when uh, Tom, Tom Hazlett, was doing um, a lot of the work that is uh, referenced in the question, um, I think the number was 97% of Americans had cable. Very, very few people relied uh, on over-the-air broadcast to get television signals. Um, most people didn't use, they didn't have any rabbit ears whatsoever. Uh, at that point, there was a really, 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 really weak case for uh, having hundreds of megahertz of spectrum allocated to uh, broadcast television when no one was using it. Everyone was getting uh, their uh, broadcast television sent to them via cable. Um, it's changed in recent years. And uh, Rob was giving us some of these uh, statistics. Uh, with the internet, we're getting cord cutters. We're getting folks who are cutting their cable cord and they're going back to broadcast to get their television content. So I, I think uh, some of the economics might have changed. Um, and I, I actually would love to ask Tom if uh, he's looked at this, um, uh, revised any of his earlier work as the, the cord cutters and cord nevers um, have uh, come to really shift a large portion of the market back to over the air. It's still a small portion, but it's much, much larger than it was even five or 10 years ago. So if Tom Hazlett is listening, we have a question for you. <laughs> so real quick, so Professor Hazlett, it's great, great to get a, uh, a question from you, from Clemson, I assume. Uh, would love to come down and talk to your classes, by the way. So, uh, But uh, your question's as uh, curated by James Gattuso. But, uh, um, actually, actually the, the question was from someone else. Oh, someone else. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I hope, Tom, you're listening. Yeah, anyway. <laughs> so, um, and just to echo a couple things, just to tie a string around the package, which is, if indeed the economics show that that spectrum is better used for something else, then the incentive auction allows the opportunity for 100% of America's television broadcasters to go off the air, leave the business, and sell all of their spectrum. I don't think that's going to happen. I don't think anyone thinks that's going to happen. Actually, a minority of TV broadcasters will go off the air um, because the economics are still there. Why are the economics still there? Because people are still watching their stuff. Uh, they produce compelling uh, content, um, and as we just saw with our tornado warning, uh, there are people, I'm sure the ratings locally here are spiking to local TV stations, um, as well as their online um, content, which is supported by their local TV stations to look at the Doppler weather radar to see where the, the tornadoes actually might be. And that's just one of many, many examples. Um, so I don't think it'll happen, but the incentive auctions will help uh, test that theory for us. Um, and I do think, as I said in my sort of constructive remarks, which is if you want more spectrum in the marketplace, I think the place to go is where the, the mother load is the largest, and that's the federal government. I'm just going to make an assumption here. I'm just guessing that the federal government, federal users are not using all of that spectrum efficiently. I know, call me crazy here at Heritage, but <laughs> I just have a funny feeling that some of that could be turned over to the private sector. And actually, in defense of the federal government, uh, there's something called PCAS, the Presidential uh, Advisory Committee on such issues. Have they, it's identified maybe 1,000 megahertz um, uh, that could be at least shared with the private sector. I, I prefer um, exclusive use auctions over sharing uh, with the federal government. But nonetheless, I think it's a good starting point for a conversation. Um, so uh, let's look at that. 
in cinema auctions are, is the opportunity for broadcasters in the marketplace to decide what's the most efficient use for spectrum. Um, I don't think it's going to happen. They're all going to go off the air. Let's look at federal spectrum. Thank you. Um, if, I, if I add in one quick a question of my own, um, we've, we've mentioned sort of danced around the, the, the question of what uh, special status broadcast or television should have. Uh, we, 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 we're joking about hurricane warnings, but uh, um, there, there's talk of the value of local television, of uh, television's role in society. <coughs> but do you think that there really should be something special in a regulatory sense uh, uh, about television, or should we treat it as a regular industry? And, and I, I go back to the early 1980s when Mark Fowler, Re President Reagan's first FCC chairman, famously said that television is just a toaster with pictures. Mm -hmm. um, do you think the television is a toaster with pictures? And, and if I could just add something out of order, I apologize, gentlemen. Um, so. Um, I do think broadcasters should be given more freedom, as, uh, as Fred was pointing out, I think, initially, uh, to experiment uh, and use their spectrum for other purposes as well. The, the law does prevent them from doing that. So if we had more flexibility there, uh, I think that would increase spectral efficiency uh, as well as help consumers. Um, but you know, his, there is the, the local model, uh, as you were pointing out, uh, economically, which is um, it is special. It has historically has been special. Will the economics of it through this, uh, through unlicensed spectrum, change? Perhaps, but it hasn't sprouted up yet. And I'd, I'd throw in a, a couple of thoughts. Uh, interestingly enough to this question of the existence of only ad-supported and subscription video and video that's supported by both, which I think is how I would characterize current cable and satellite television, uh, where they've discovered that they can uh, both sell a subscription and get you to watch ads, uh, which is also the way XM Sirius has gone as well. Uh, the internet provides some interesting uh, insight. YouTube, I believe, is entirely ad supported. They, they may have some channels or models where there's payments, but I, because I don't, I don't, by the way, I don't really consume video, so that's my disclaimer. I almost <laughs> never watch television of any kind on any screen. Uh, but I talk about it. So <laughs> you use your toasters for toast. Well, yes, yes, I'm, sadly. Uh, but, I, you know, and so they, and they seem to be successful with that. Of course, it's generally uh, content they obtain. Uh, for free from all of you volunteers. Um, so they don't have any content costs. You know, there's Netflix, which uh, does have a content cost and says, you know, two-thirds to 80 percent, something along, a, a large proportion of their operational costs is the acquisition of content, which is typical for what, I guess, uh, economists might call high-quality content, content with good production values. I don't know anybody uh, sitting in their uh, bedroom or garage that could produce Game of Thrones, for example. Um, so, you know, that type of content tends to be uh, subscriber uh, financed. I raise it because it's interesting to me. It, it might provide insights into the type of content that can be uh, perhaps ad supported only versus types of content that maybe uh, require subscription payments and the like, uh, abs you know, in a more pure market based environment. And online video is about the most free market version we've probably ever seen. Um, and, and uh, what was the other question? Because I had a thought on that, too. I just was going backwards. Special status. Oh, the special status. You know, it's, it, the special status of broadcast television is based on the fact that they use spectrum that Commissioner McDowell's been talking about, or, you know, the wireless airwaves or whatever you want to think of it as. Uh, it's just really electromagnetic radiation, but blah, blah, blah. Anyway, uh, you know, there is some question as to whether that has any merit any longer since the same, you know, for example, the spectrum used by broadcasters that then is auctioned off and used by mobile carriers. If that's the distinguishing characteristic, then do mobile carriers have special obligations? Well, they don't currently. Uh, there's some question as to whether that notion's been discredited. Uh, I raise it, though, because Traditionally, the, the courts have been very reluctant to say it's discredited and, and why. 
it's interesting if you're a policymaker that, you know, because I, I failed to mention before, but I said there's the competition option for broadcast TV. There's the sort of keep it the way it is because we like free over the air television for those consumers who are low income or what have you. Another option is to get rid of it altogether. Uh, and I, I know there are advocates out there who would say, get rid of uh, over the air television altogether. Uh, Congress has not said that, but there, there are uh, people who would say that. Well, for the incentive auction. It, could, it possibly could. Uh, what's interesting about that to me is, you know, at the same time someone might say that, so the current FCC chairman suggested that all broadcasters should just put their programming online. Well, the special court-based exception uh, for imposing lots of content restrictions on broadcasters, you know, the reason it passes First Amendment scrutiny to have an indecency restriction, is based on their use of spectrum. So if they go online, what happens to that? And, and the reason I raise it is, is not to attack the chairman. It, it's, I'm trying to be think tank and academic here. It is an interesting question. On, on, in a speech uh, in the spring, he says they should distribute online. They don't need to use the airwaves. Uh, then there's uh, the speech about, you know, we're going to look into whether or not the use of the Redskins name for the Washington football team is indecent, and therefore a broadcaster should use their license, should lose their license for using it, and by the way, I make no comment whatsoever on the substance of that question. I raise it in the context of that's permissible under the First Amendment only because of their traditional special status. So another question that's raised, if, if you think the option is, you know, abolish it, is a, a lot of things that, that uh, many out there sort of take for granted with respect to what you get when you watch an over-the-air broadcast network. They don't. They they at least currently don't apply online or on cable or satellite TV. Uh, so, uh, a couple of responses uh, to what has been said and to the question itself. Starting with uh, the question itself, the special status question. One of the perplexing things or interesting things about broadcast television to the current generation is most people, most television consumers, don't make much of a distinction between the broadcasters and the non-broadcast channels. You all get your television content uh, via the internet, and half the time you don't know um, what channel it's coming from because you're watching clips of it uh, on YouTube or you're getting it from Netflix, and you don't know if it was originally an HBO show or an ABC show or a CW show. You don't know. You don't care. Um, uh, that's not always the case, but sometimes you do. So from the consumer perspective, um, in terms of the uh, entertainment programming component of broadcast television, I don't know that there's much special status, much distinction. Where there is a distinction, where there is importance, um, is on the information side and to uh, a lesser extent, um, I personally think, uh, the, the sports side. Um, the information side is where things get really interesting and where I think that there is some special status and some uh, reason to attribute special status to local broadcasters. Um, uh, taking, going back to the tornado example, um, yes, there probably are a lot more people tuning into local broadcasters right now. It's possible, and this is where the concern is, that when there aren't tornadoes going on, there aren't enough people tuning into the local broadcasters for all of them or many of them to stay on the air. And then when there is a tornado happening, you go and you say, oh no, you go to turn on the television and get local news and information and you can't find it because you only care about it when you care about it. The rest of the time, you're not gonna be putting money uh, into the pot in order to uh, uh, justify the existence of a local broadcaster. So in that sense, we might think, okay, this is something that we want to make sure exists. Now the question then is how do we make sure that exists? Um, uh, the spectrum model that we've historically used is one form of subsidy. We're giving the broadcasters this valuable spectrum that they can capitalize on, that they can monetize through advertisements and programming. They get content from uh, national networks uh, that they put on the air the rest of the time. It's amazingly enough, the local Channel 7 isn't local news 24 hours a day. It's local news about 30 minutes a day. Um, the rest of the time, it's uh, not necessarily uh, local content. Most of the time, it's not local content. Um, we could definitely come up with other ways to fund these uh, stations. We, we could do away with any national program whatsoever. We could say uh, local broadcasters are a local issue. 
Um, it's up to the states to find ways to fund and support your local broadcasters. We could, uh, in principle, uh, disassociate the special treatment of local broadcasters from Spectrum. We could say, um, local broadcasters, your local video content producers, um, you can buy Spectrum like anyone else and have a television station, or you can distribute online or mobile. Um, the key then is how do we make sure that people get access, that consumers, uh, citizens, get access to this material? Uh, do I, do we say, okay, we're going to make sure that everyone out there can afford a smartphone with a data plan sufficient to watch local uh, video content being produced by the local news and information uh, channel um, when there's a tornado or on a nightly basis to get the local news? Um, uh, there also are uh, very important historical reasons, I think. Uh, I'm definitely not advocating pulling the spectrum out from under the local uh, broadcasters. Um, two other things I want to... Uh, can, I, can I jump in real quick? Okay, yeah, yes, yes. Because that was a lot. Yeah, that was, um, okay. I want to just clarify a couple points. Broadcasters today actually do pay for their spectrum at auction. If, if you get two applicants for the same channel in a market, they actually go to auction like any other spectrum. Uh, ironically, your satellite TV providers don't because mm -hmm. Congress in 2000 had, did a special act that says they don't pay for Spectrum at auction. So the, the reason I raise the relevance of that, you're, you might be saying to yourself, well, well, it doesn't matter if they pay for it or not. And like, you know, the traditional notion of broad over-the-air TV stations being special, i.e., we, we, the government, can impose indecency restrictions on them that might be invalid under the First Amendment for anyone else. Uh, cable or satellite TV, was that they used the spectrum. Well, satellite TV uses the spectrum. Actually, cable operators traditionally used the spectrum, although my guess is that's diminishing because they used to use what were called CARS licenses, cable really about service. links and downlinks. And yeah, the, the CARS licenses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I mean, so, you know, that justification was the 1934 justification. I'm going back and clarifying what I meant by you can question the validity of it. Certainly today to say that broadcasters somehow should be subject to this or that because they're using the spectrum for free, I would say, well, actually, they're subject to an auction requirement, whereas some others who arguably compete with them are not. So it's the spectrum question, I just wanted to say, is a very muddy basis these days for, for coming to any conclusions about, about video. Uh, but then continue. So I, I want to. Uh, yeah, we probably should go to questions. Right. Oh, okay. So I, I want to uh, keep two more things on that we haven't really touched on uh, that build off of uh, the the, video, the toaster with video uh, question and also uh, something that Rob said earlier. Uh, so when the toaster with video um, comment was made, it was a joke. But we are entering a world of toasters with video screens and refrigerators with video screens and microwaves with video screens. With video being displayed everywhere, you can be watching uh, your, um, I'm, I keep using this example when I'm talking, you could be watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer in your living room, you could uh, then walk into your kitchen and it could automatically transfer to the screen on uh, your refrigerator so you don't miss a thing, then you go outside to check your mail and it transfers to your phone, and you just keep watching it. It's all one program going between all these different screens. So you walk into a wall or fall yeah. out a manhole. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, but you'll, you'll still get wireless signal even in the manhole. Yeah, and yeah, your, yeah. your phone you will drop be phone. a little light so you can find the ladder and get out. And just to be clear, it's um, not just Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Not, not only Buffy, right. Um, the, the other point I'd like to make, and this flips things around quite a bit. This goes back to a, a point that uh, Rob made earlier. Uh, one of the requirements that we have for broadcasters is for politicians. Uh, for political advertising and political coverage that requires equal time to be given to uh, a politician. So if I'm a broadcaster, I can't sell ads to only one political party. If I sell ads to one, I need to sell ads to all other candidates. Um, I can't pick cost, and choose, yeah. um, right, and at, equal, and, uh, at uh, equal costs. Well, one thing that I'm honestly somewhat concerned about, these only apply to broadcasters. What happens when we're approaching the, the, the next presidential election and uh, the owners of some big media company, let's call it Google, says, you know what, we're worried about how the polls are looking. Let's spend the, the last two weeks before this election running a pre-video ad for our preferred political candidate for everyone watching a YouTube video for these two weeks. Is there any regulation over that? No. Should there be? 
That's the question. I, I'll, I'll, I'll add the implica implications of the FCC chairman's point that over the air broadcasters should go online in decency, political, both First Amendment restrictions, but they go beyond that, and, and including to if you want a free service that's ad supported, ads on the internet are largely controlled by one company who also is arguably, according to many reports, able to charge the most for various reasons that are way beyond the scope of this discussion. But the point is, how do you have an ad-supported support service on the Internet where a middleman takes a large percentage of those profits? And so you've – the implications of ideas like that can, can go far beyond the obvious uh, when, you, when you dig in. And we've been looking at the past, how they apply in the future. That's – is where things get if very I'm, interesting. If I can jump on the bias point, I mean, just, just hypothetically, I know this is far fetched, but hypothetically, say you have a newspaper like the New York Times that, that has predominantly liberal views. I mean, I know that really couldn't happen in real life, but uh, <laughs> you know, and, and they endorse candidates and they, 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 they take a point of view. I mean, uh, you know, my, my point is, is that sort of bias in media anything new, or mm -hmm. is it just what, something that, that we've had in, in uh, print media forever? It, mm -hmm. It's called the First Amendment. Citizens United case and all the rest. That's a topic for a whole other that, that, that's panel. Right. I think we can have. Uh, so why, why don't we finally see if there's any questions from the audience yeah. after after all this? We talk them to death. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Here, and then um, you go first, and then we'll on that side. Of the room. I'm going to sit. I don't want to stand over everybody. So we talked a lot about some of the. Um, treatment that broadcasters are getting and, and have been getting because the technology was the basic beginning point, now we're moving in and moving forward. Is there anything that broadcasters are receiving today, any kind of benefit that they are receiving today from the government that they should not be getting moving forward, or should they be getting certain preferential treatment in perpetuity? Are there things that, that they should always keep as we move forward with the Communications Act update and we move toward new video marketplace rules. Can I just jump in real quick? So broadcasters get their licenses renewed every eight years. They can lose those licenses. That's at the discretion of the FCC, right? Um, they invest you know, millions of dollars in their facilities, in their news gathering, in their microwave trucks, and the personnel. Uh, most of them contribute to the community in a variety of ways, uh, by goodwill, contributions, not only goodwill to capital G, but then too. Um, so there's a lot that goes on, but the uh, the FCC can pull their licenses. So um, yes, in exchange for uh, what used to be, uh, but is no longer free use of the airwaves, they have what are called public interest obligations. They must serve their communities of license. Uh, and it gets more complicated than that. Uh, that's part of what we call localism. Are they serving the local communities? Um, so those are all uh, requirements, and, and they're many-fold, actually. There's children's TV program. There's a lot there. But, um, so, and they're, they're happy to do most of it, uh, but I think in a, you know, there's no other platform that has to live under those uh, regulations. So I, I do think we need to re-examine all of that. Yeah, I, I'll just throw in, I'm basically echoing the commissioner's remarks. Uh, Congress has tried to do a balance between their obligations, which are more stringent than on any other video provider. Um, they're subject to more ownership restrictions, the indecency restrictions, spectrum limitations, business model limitations. Uh, at the same time, if you look at, you know, there's also a benefit side of the ledger where they have things like must carry and the like. And if the question is, well, which ones on the benefit sides of the ledger no longer should apply, I, I, I have taken the position that because they're is an attempt to balance them and make them offset, that that's a very dangerous way to proceed. Uh, because which benefit, at which point do you, do you reach a tipping point where now their burdens are too high for them to be successful? And the reason I think that's relevant is, you know, uh, well, you'd have to get into a lot of regulatory philosophy, but, uh, you know, once uh, uh, Congress has set up a regime that's encouraged people to invest, and I, there's a study that says there's been about $50 billion spent on buying television stations on the secondary market, and those investors put their money in subject to a certain set of rules. Uh, changing those rules without providing some sort of transition mechanism 
uh, and changing them in a way so that they just go out of business and lose their investment just strikes me as patently unfair. So uh, I think it needs to be looked at holistically. Uh, I, I think there are a couple of regular, you know, I'm on record in a couple of cases, uh, you know, uh, saying, well, if you elect retransmission consent, and this is probably gobbledygook to most of you, <laughs> uh, then you know, maybe you shouldn't be entitled to basic tier as a matter of law because it could be part of the negotiation. I mean, I think there are some tweaks you can do and the like that aren't, aren't maybe uh, too unbalancing. But a lot of the proposals that I've seen out there, and the FY, there's a lot of proposals to remove a lot of benefits from the benefit side of the ledger for broadcasters without touching any of the burden uh, obligations. And I just think that's a recipe to uh, TV stations going out of business. Now, if your view is we don't need them and they're wasteful and we want them to go out of business, but we don't want to tell uh, the public that's what we're doing, that's a great idea. <laughs> because you change some obscure regulations that the public generally doesn't pay much attention to, and then when the TV stations go out of business three or four years later, I don't have no idea what happened. But uh, I'd say from a sort of a, a good policy perspective, the more holistic approach, the better, which is, uh, you know, going to Rob's point about the comment mm -hmm. update, I think the whole act given the inter you know that video is both you know it's online and in the satellite cable space and broadcast we really need a holistic approach to try to sort all of that out rather than piecemeal uh, changes that might lead to unintended consequences um, over here thank you I think the panel has done a really good job today of uh, pointing out the complexities <laughs> of the regulatory structure in place right now, um, how redundant it is in some issue places and out of step with modern technology. Um, but we haven't really dug into any specific reforms. One that I was thinking of is the Next Generation Television Marketplace Act, which was sponsored in the Senate by uh, Heritage's current president. Um, and I was wondering if you guys considered that uh, still a good place to start, or do you have other free market reforms in place? in mind well I'm, I'm on record on on I don't know if that specific proposal but the the general idea and uh, I've taken the position that from a, as I by the way my think tank is generally in favor of free market policies so there's a lot of good free market in there because it would have a, a lot of deregulation but most of the regulations that are eliminated are all on the benefit side for the broadcaster. So I've written a paper where I say, to, in, in order for that to work, in my opinion, and protect those legitimate investor-backed expectations, you would also need to deregulate the burden side. And I, I gave a list of the kind of burdens that I think would, would be eliminated and, and more or less turned it into uh, a free market enterprise, if you will, more like the way the online space is today. And with the FCC's announcement that they're going to be looking into classifying online video distributors as cable operators, if you will, that's that's a, not really, it's MVPDs. But, uh, you know, the, the tendency always it tends to be to regulate up. So in that respect, I think it's good that that act w would propose to regulate down, but I also think it's problematic and, and, and um potentially unfair that it regulates down on only one side of the ledger for the most part. Um, if you're going to deregulate, I think it needs to be, you, you, hopefully, you try to do a balanced approach or, or even a complete deregulation. But uh, the tendency currently seems to be regulating up, not down, uh, at least with, the, with where the FCC is going. You know, I'll um, echo much of what Fred just said. A lot of the regulatory reforms um, over the last several years either regulatory or deregulatory, have been asymmetric. They've uh, either uh, deliberately or unintentionally had um, some uh, plan that would dramatically affect uh, the ledger on one side or the other, and they don't really try and maintain balance. The challenge moving forward, I think, we are currently in a regulatory posi uh, position uh, where the ecosystem is somewhat ossified it's hard to see how a lot of the traditional television content um, is going to uh, move to the online ecosystem uh, in a way that looks, that, that serves the localism goals, that serves the news and information goals, 
um, that we've historically valued. Um, it's hard to see how that's going to happen with the current set of rules. What I think we need to be thinking about is some way to uh, symmetrically deregulate, to maintain the current balance while alleviating the regulatory burden so that we can see innovation occurring um, in the marketplace, uh, innovation that isn't occurring today. And the question is, how do we accomplish that? That's the hard question. And as I uh, mentioned at the outset, a lot of the uh, language, that statutory language in uh, the Communications Act, the 34 Act uh, as amended by uh, the two cable acts and uh, subsequent um, uh, revisions, it speaks very frequently in very specific terms um, that simply doesn't apply in the online ecosystem. So it's really holding us to the past. Um, and I think that those are tethers that we need to try and break. So real quick, so in general, um, a deregulatory thrust, to echo my colleagues here, I think is the, is the right way to go. Um, we uh, have seen only the opposite thus far uh, in the past few years, and I think the next couple of years we're going to see even more regulation of, of broadcasters. As was pointed out, too, with the asymmetric regulation, what happens is you have the end up happening is, is, is the politic politicization, if I could only say that word, um, uh, regulation. Uh, so which... Uh, platform is favored by the state and which is disfavored. Um, but we're also starting to see the broadcastification uh, of other platforms. Um, and I'm going to bring up just briefly net neutrality, uh, which in many regards uh, by its core proponents um, is to bring broadcast style regulation to the internet. Uh, I'm not making that up. Go look at the June 20 testimony of Professor Tim Wu. I testified alongside, uh, alongside him for the House Judiciary Committee, so look on their website. And that, you know, it's content-based regulation <laughs> for the greater societal good uh, by, in the view of the proponents. And that is where you have the state balancing speech, muting the speech of some, amplifying the speech of others, all in the name of free speech. And actually that is per se censorship under our constitutional jurisprudence, when there's state involvement of the balancing of speech. When you have private parties trying to shut each other down, uh, that is called a debate. That is not censorship. Those are private parties arguing with each other, and that's what you want. When we saw things like the Fairness Doctrine dis disappear from the broadcast spa uh, space, you saw a great rise in political speech and discourse. For better or for worse, you can hate some stuff or like it or whatever, but there was more of it. You know, during the days of the Fairness Doctrine, broadcasters just didn't want to take that risk of having political speech, political opinion, aired over their licensed airwaves so that in lieu of political, political shows, they aired shows on you know, baking or gardening or whatever, uh, things that were less controversial, unless it was like whole wheat versus white bread or something. Like <laughs> passionate debates there. But the point I'm trying to make is regulation only grows, uh, to Fred's uh, point. Uh, I think that's actually a quote by Adam Thierry, uh, which I always uh, like to give him an attribution. Um, and we need to reverse that uh, overall. So we need to look to, uh, for some deregulatory legislation in the years to come. I just want to note, we went one hour, 21 minutes before net neutrality was mentioned. That's a new record. And, and it, uh, uh, Tom Hazlett, our friend uh, uh, down at Clemson right now, uh, he did some of the seminal research uh, showing that when the Fairness Doctrine went away, um, uh, uh, political debate uh, style programming started to increase dramatically. By the way, since we've been talking, the Dow has fallen 404 points. I hope that's not cause and effect. But that's what you it, it might be the massive tornado damage outside. Is that what it is? Anyone else? Yes. Jack Spencer Heritage. Um, Gus, you had me at nuke the whole system. Because it seems to me ever since, once you said that, everyone has talked about the need for reform, but still um, defending the need for regulation at some level, for a lot of localism stuff. And it seems to be underpinned by this notion that the market that consumers will not go after and support the things that everyone is sort of saying the policymakers want, which is this local content. That seems odd to me. I mean, consumers do pay for local content. Consumers do pay for the sports stuff. Consumers pay for all kinds of goofy things that people put judgments on one way or the other. So why is it that in this context, you think that that justifies this massive regulation that constrains the um, the technological innovations that, that, that could be occurring. I just don't understand why, why it is that consumers won't support 
local content if it's so important and why that justifies regulation? I, I think it's a great question, and maybe we're aiming this at Gus. I mean, in my paper, I took the position deregulate it, uh, you know, my future of, of video paper, because I do think, so there is evidence that local news, for example, has value. I mean, I don't think there's any question that, that it has value, and therefore, one would think that the market would support that on, at some level going forward, even in the absence of regulation. But the, why, do I, why did I want to jump in? It, to me, this is an example of sort of the question of priorities and the, and the balance between, you know, sort of outcomes and burdens. So, for example, what I don't know, and it was the answer I gave to, to the point uh, uh, about, you know, Tom Hazlitt's position, what I don't know is how much local news the market would support, and especially in any given market, because that varies even today. So why is that relevant? Well, the FCC wants to ensure there's at least four uh, separate, separately owned TV stations, all with their own news, and they just did some rules around, you know, limitations on what uh, TV stations can do with respect to ad selling and news and, well, expanding it to news and the like. So. What I would say is, well, if you want at least four different local news channels with different uh, local news reporters and the like, would the market support that? Maybe, maybe not. Now, of course, my as, as a free market uh, advocate, I would say if the market won't support it, it's, it's probably not necessary. Uh, as long as there's local news and, you know, I think in large markets you probably have two at least. Also, all the other sources, bloggers and Twitter and the like, I think it'd be fine. But it's a good question because it kind of points out that we have a set of burdens that there has to be this much, and those set of burdens are not related. Those when those rules were adopted so many decades ago, I don't remember. Uh, they weren't based on market demand today. There's no relationship between the burdens and market demand, is what I would suggest, and I do think that's a problem. And so I. Uh, I'm the one who started by saying my background at the nuclear bombs lab would be a, a great way to uh, give me the tools to nuke the entire system. Um, uh, I'm sympathetic to uh, the point. The question is uh, how do we get to uh, the deregulated position? Um, and my concern is that we are in a the, the current market let's call it the current system, let's not call it a market. The current system works because it is being held up, it's being supported, it's being mandated by regulation. If we were to pull out that scaffolding, um, it's not at all clear that we would, uh, ha how the system would sort itself out. Um, so I, I think that we need to unroll the regulation. Um, and uh, th this is what, in many instances, we're trying to do. The incentive auctions, uh, the entire, uh, I, I don't want this to sound like I'm defending it, the entire premise of the 96 Telecom Act, it was uh, very much a, a carrot and stick sort of a, a approach. We're going to try and transition to a competitive market by uh, giving, creating incentives for people to move towards competition and to stick for those, to hit those who don't. Um, so I think that we need to start thinking about the carrots and sticks that we can implement to move away from regulation here. Just to follow up on Jack's question, you know, it seems like a lot of our discussion is um, based implicitly on, 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 a, on a, an idea that, that deregulation would be an unknown, that, that, that it would be untried, you know, we may want to go in that direction, but we have to move carefully. But, but wouldn't it be just as true to, to, to say that deregulation is the norm? Uh, aside from the, the, the really just uh, coincidental fact that, 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 that broadcast technology used spectrum, it, it really in principle should be no different than, than print, uh, where, where we've had newspapers for 150, 200 years and no particular, uh, at least in the U.S., no, no, no particular regulator or, or, or oversight authority saying, well, you need this many local newspapers, this many national newspapers. So our, our, it, it wouldn't the goal just be to go back to, to what, what was the system before uh, um, you know, Marconi came up with the radio uh, and apply the same rules to the new technologies? 
Well, it, if we were to do that, so to give a concrete example of the concern, um, the relationship between every broadcaster and every uh, cable satellite MVPD out there is uh, defined with the background rules of must carry and retransmission consent. We pull those out from under these uh, uh, relationships. It's completely unclear what the contracts would look like in the but for world. Suddenly, what are the uh, provisions governing must, uh, the carriage of content today? How long is it going to take the system to resort all of these contracts? These are complex commercial negotiations. Um, we would be risking possibly basically turning off television um, for months <coughs> while, this, while the system works itself out. We're not going to do that. Well, I agree with you both. <laughs> and, Very uh, diplomatic. And, you know, in, in other words, I think... You're wrong. I, 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 I would agree that I don't see any reason why it couldn't be deregulated, but I also would agree that the, by, if you're going to do a major deregulation, the, the experience has shown that some sort of transition period is very useful. And the FCC's done transitions where what it does, it gives the industry notice of what the rules are going to be, which goes back to my, you know, investment back investment backed expectations approach and gives them time to do those negotiations and the like and have a transition that if it's done well, by the time it actually ends, no one even notices. Uh, the DTV transition pretty much ended up that way and and uh, you know, there was a time when mobile wireless pro cell phone providers uh, were required to use a particular analog signal, and the FCC gave them five years to transition, and when they actually shut those systems down, I, I, I don't remember a, single, noticed. a mm -hmm. single consumer complaint coming into the FCC that the change had even happened because it was transparent to them. So I, to that extent, I mean, I, I do think when you have a pervasively regulated industry and you want to deregulate it, pulling the rug out from under that industry in a very short time frame, either just outright eliminate the regulations and it's effective immediately, or having a short transition period can be very problematic because uh, uh, there's going to be disruption. I, I think there are transition problems. I, I just wanted to stand up for Jack, by the way, because he is my boss. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, I, I, actually, we're, we're, we're out of time, but why don't we... Um, uh, um, we maybe take one more question. And then back to the back. Exactly. The preceding question stole a lot of the thunder, but uh, to perhaps boil it down a little bit, then I think adoration of Ronald Reagan here would be universal. And one of his sayings was, um, "Correct me if I mangle this, but uh, government's view is." If something moves, tax it. If it keeps moving, regulate it. If it stops moving, subsidize it. Similarly, it, it sounds, when you talk about this holistic approach, and you know the best option might be whether it's slow or immediate, a complete deregulation, one begins to get the sense, though, that what you're saying is one group is overregulated and unfairly so. Therefore, to help them survive or to prop them up, as you talked about with the structure, let's regulate a bunch of other people as well. And that when reform is suggested, perhaps for other parts of the industry, well, no, that's terrible because we need these regulations under that third prong of, of Reagan's speech uh, you know, of subsidizing. Prop us up because you're hurting us in other ways. To what extent are, are you saying that? that we're regulating one part, so therefore let's regulate a bunch of other people as well. That, that seems to be an inference that can be drawn. Well, that's, I, oh, go ahead. You know, and that's, that's actually an important dichotomy I was trying to get to earlier, which is the, the real debate is here that the direction where things are going is there's going to be broadcast style regulation on all platforms, including you know, new digital medias, media platforms. Um, so uh, we need to kind of pull in that tug of war, pull back the other way and, and hopefully get towards the, the, the sanity uh, sweet spot uh, for that. So that, that's really what's happening here for the next two years. I mean, so in terms of, you know, let's talk about broadcasters for a minute. They are not allowed uh, to, uh, anymore, to um, uh, enter into joint sales agreements and shared services agreements. And what that means is they're not allowed to find efficiencies within markets where there might be a decline in, in local news. The local news model it's, it's expensive at news gatherers out there, microwave trucks and everything else. So is there a way for uh, TV stations 
uh, to pool some resources so you can continue to have uh, the gathering of vital information um, for local communities. But right now, the FCC is going in the opposite direction because it's looking at uh, local video markets, TV markets very myopically, uh, myopically. They're not looking at the video market. They're looking at just how many TV stations are there in a DMA, in a, in a, in a market, this the city, the market, doesn't get any market area. And uh, that is the market, rather than looking at all the other video competition there. Meanwhile, as ad dollars might go to, and eyeballs go to uh, new digital technologies, uh, it's becoming harder to maintain the, the model. So why can't they enter into contracts with one another to increase their efficiency. And the FCC is going in the wrong direction uh, in that, in my view. Um, and that's really, should be at the crux of the debate rather than the other things we've been talking about. I think. And I, if I've got the time, I would say, great question because I think that's what we were talking about. We were both using the term regulate up. Yeah. I mean, right mm -hmm. now, I've, I've done a chart where, you know, broadcasters probably, not probably, they're the most regulated, the most number of restrictions, and they do have some benefits. And then you've got sort of the MVPDs, but cable's somewhat different. Cable has the next most amount, and then you have satellite TV, uh, and then you have the online video distribu distributors, which currently have almost no regulation, not, not quite zero. And I think the question you're raising is, I mean, a couple of options. You can leave things the same. Uh, you could deregulate the ones that are more heavily regulated in a holistic, you know, even-handed kind of manner. Or you can, why aren't we regulating those other guys? And, and thus far, I think it's been left the same because, you know, Netflix, for example, testified in front of the Canadian regulator recently and said, hey, we're not a competitor, you know, uh, to cable television broadcast because currently they're not offering linear pro like real-time event programming and the like but if you want to think futuristically or forward-looking as a as a policymaker the question is well they can change that whenever they reach an agreement to do so so you know the question is if and when they do what is the scheme are we going to then say oh well they need to be regulated the same way or and that's the regulate up or do we want to bring the whole level down E either way, I mean, in, in my view, f for a free market to work effectively, the rules of the road need to be the same for similar or, or substitutable services, at least to the maximum extent possible. That's clearly not what we have now. Uh, right. The question is, wh what do we do? Gus, you have the last word. Uh, so. Uh Lucky <laughs> word. Um, so uh, again, great question. Uh, I, I just want to, one thing we haven't commented on that Fred just touched on, the Communications Act as it stands right now is a Byzantine labyrinthine mess. Um, uh, we've got definitions for MVPD, satellite, cable, MMDS, other things. Different rules apply differently. We've got different must-carry rules for satellite and cable. Must-carry doesn't apply to uh, MVPD, which is what online video, linear online video, would be. Retransmission consent, though, does apply. Um, it, just trying to figure out what all does and doesn't apply to these different categorizations is a nightmare. So. First things first, we need some rationalization here. Then we need rationalization, deregulation, uh, and the, the example uh, that Rob gives in response to the question of uh, the joint sales agreements, uh, this goes back to the fundamental problem of, uh, that we face with local. Local, in many cases, might be uneconomic. Part of the reason it's uneconomic is because we've got regulations making it more expensive to run these businesses. Well, th th this is just backwards. So I think that that might be a great last word. This is just backwards. So, so we need a more rational system, and we're counting on Congress to do it. <laughs> right, I tried uh, to end on it. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Uh, you can tell that there, there, there are a lot of issues here. I think we, we've barely been able to touch the, 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 scratch the surface on most of them. But, but I think the panel did a very good job of, of giving an overview. Uh, so if you can thank the panel for being here today. Um, <laughs> I um, hope, hope uh, you guys got, got uh, um, um, found this worthwhile and see you at the next event.